on the first uh, set of passages, very interesting, a number of places, and I'll, I'll uh, focus on Luke 1 and 2, so the birth and infancy narrative in Luke, where first Zechariah, who becomes the father of John the baptizer, and then Mary, who becomes the mother of Jesus, are um, met, un unexpected visitors, they're met by Gabriel, by a divine a messenger, by an angel. And so as we have in, in Theophanies, as we have in the uh, manifesting or the revealing of God in the Hebrew Bible, we have the natural reaction of fear of the human who uh, encounters uh, God or God's messenger. And so uh, Zechariah is terrified and the angel says to him, don't be afraid. So we have that formulaic, uh, do not fear, do not be uh, afraid. So this is the counter to that to fear of God that we're exploring. So for Zechariah, then, uh, Gabriel, uh, then uh, Gabriel to Mary, Mary in uh, <clears throat> Luke 1, 28 to 31. Again, don't be afraid. Uh, Mary, you found favor with God and she will receive the good news that she will bear a son, uh, Jesus. And then the uh, shepherds out in the field uh, just after Jesus is born, chorus of angels, the glory of the Lord shines round the uh, shepherds, and they're terrified. But the angel says to them, "Fear not, don't don't be afraid." And again, the message is is uh, one of good news: a savior, the Messiah, is born this day. So uh, face to face with the holy, so we encounter God as a holy and powerful other. The first uh, set of passages, it's through God's messenger, through the angel. In this passage in Luke 5, it's, it's Jesus himself. So here's where uh, Jesus um, meets um, Simon. Actually, <clears throat> at the end of chapter 4 in Luke, Jesus has already healed Simon's mother-in-law. Uh, so Simon Peter uh, has already had some contact with Jesus. Uh, but Simon uh, uh, comes to Jesus as he's teaching the crowds from a boat. And here's where um, they've had a long night without success fishing, Simon Peter with his fishing companions. And Jesus says, um, uh, put your, you know, <clears throat> let your nets down, uh, uh, you'll, you'll catch some fish. No, we've worked all night, I've caught nothing, um, but I'll do it. And so they, they catch so many fish, their nets are about to tear. And, and so they're filling the boats with fish and Simon Peter sees it, falls down at Jesus' knees saying, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He and all who were with him were amazed. So here is not fear as much as ama amazement, but also Simon Peter recognizes he's in the presence of a power beyond him, of, of a holy presence. And so his reaction is to recoil, to step back because he's very aware um, that he is a, a sinful human being. It remind, reminds me of Isaiah 6 and the call to the prophet Isaiah. And in the presence of the holy, um, the prophet um, is uh, overcome with a sense of his own uh, sinfulness. So um, Jesus says to Simon, fear not, don't be afraid. Um, from now on, you'll be catching people. So uh, this is a, a kind of call and commissioning of Peter He's going to have a new vocation as a fisher. He'll be bringing um, hope to human beings. So uh, fear before the holy, <clears throat> uh, awareness of sin, falling short, a lacking, and nevertheless being embraced, being accepted, and in fact called um, by Jesus. Now, um, this next category, number of passages in the book of Acts, typically these Gentiles who have already uh, come to participate in the worship of God in the synagogue, uh, life of the synagogue, have not become full converts to Judaism, but are Gentile God wor worshipers. The phrase that's used uh, is uh, God fearer, typically translated God fearer. Uh, in the CEB, let's say even in the newer bystander version, not translated that way. So here uh, in the NRSV, a worshiper of God, Sebomene. So this is one of the ways in which the fear of God uh, terms from the Old Testament are translated into the, into the Greek sabamanas. So Lydia, so a, a prosperous merchant in purple uh, dye fabric, 
is called by Paul and uh, becomes a follower of Jesus. Uh, she's already a worshiper of God as a Gentile, a God-fearer. And in Athens, uh, God-fearers among uh, the Jews in the synagogue uh, to whom Paul speaks. And again, uh, in Corinth, it is uh, Justice, a uh, worshiper of God, a uh, Sabah Menu, Tan So this is picking up the theme of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible. Fear of God is a way really of talking about a, a reverence for God, worship of God. And here, this is one of the other um, ways in which the New Testament builds on and expands what we have in the Old Testament. Um, is not only the focus through Jesus and becoming followers of God through uh, Jesus and Jesus' um, uh, successors, his apostles, um, but also the extension of that to Gentiles uh, in ways far beyond the hints and corners that we get in the, in the Old Testament. So one other set of passages, and then I'll, I'll stop and see if there's some things here you'd like to have some conversation with, and then we'll explore uh, a couple more uh, types of passages. So a um, number of passages, I will look at three briefly. Uh, so we saw face to face with the holy in the case of Simon Peter, a kind of amazement and, and fear. And, and Jesus responds, don't be afraid. And Jesus has a vocation, a new vocation for Peter. Um, here, this first passage, uh, face to face with the holy, a, a kind of fear again, as we um, uh, uh, are on holy ground. Uh, Matthew 17, this is the, uh, Matthean account of the transfiguration, so a pre-glimpse of Jesus' um, full glory. So Jesus has with him Peter and James and, and James' brother uh, John. They go up to the mountain, and Jesus was uh, transfigured before them. Um, uh, face shines like the sun, clothes dazzling light. Moses and Elijah talking with him. So here, uh, Jesus in continuity with these le uh, leading voices, agents of God, uh, bearer of law and prophets uh, from Hebrew scripture. And so Peter's a little baffled. Uh, we want to stay here for a while. Uh, look, I'll build some booths for, for you all. And uh, we'll just linger for a while and enjoy the moment. Um, a bright cloud overshadows them. So cloud uh, is one of the ways in which divine presence is experienced in the Old Testament. We have that also in the New Testament is here. From the cloud of voice, this is my son, the beloved. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So picking up the divine voice uh, heard at the baptism of Jesus. So now again, singling out Jesus as the beloved son of God. When the disciples hear it, they fall to the ground. They're overcome by fear. And Jesus comes, touches them, and says, get up, don't be afraid. So again, this formula, this a call to the human, uh, overwhelmed by uh, awe and fear in the presence of the holy. Uh, don't, don't be afraid. They look up, they see just Jesus himself. So there's no confusion about who the beloved son and who, who, whom they're to listen to. It is indeed uh, Jesus. And of course, they then go back down the mountain and back into the fray, back into uh, helping the, the, the sick and the, the needy. Now, the arrest of Jesus in John 18, a fascinating passage, and, and the, the, the sense of this as an encounter with the divine is masked a little bit in translation. So, so this is where Judas is bringing the soldiers uh, to, uh, to, so they can seize Jesus, um, arrest him, take him before the governor. And so in John, it's very interesting. Jesus, knowing everything that's to happen, comes forward and asks them, uh, whom are you looking for? And if it left out a preposition there, for whom are you looking? Whom are you seeking? And so this big, uh, huge uh, company of soldiers there, and they answer, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replies, now in translation, I am he, the Greek is I go in me, which we could just translate, I am. Judas, the one who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, I am, they stepped back and fell to the ground. That's a pretty amazing scene, right? All these soldiers come out to arrest Jesus. They've got all the power. He says, I am, and they fall back uh, to the ground. So what, this, what John is doing and telling um, of the arrest here is recalling actually uh, the, the Old Testament um, 
presentation of God as I am. So back to Moses and the burning bush, right? Exodus 3. Moses, you know, who am I supposed to tell? You're sending me um, back to confront Pharaoh and to bring the people to freedom. Who shall I say is sending me? And God's answer is, is basically, I am. Uh, I am who I am. And tell them I am is sending you. And this is picked up later, for example, in the prophet Isaiah, God is, I am. So when Jesus uh, says in response to the soldiers, I am, that is, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, they experience this as this powerful, um, you know, uh, encounter with, with the Holy One himself. So uh, again, fear before uh, uh, the Holy God now uh, encountered in the person of Jesus. Now, finally, at the uh, empty tomb at the end of Mark's gospel, and Mark especially accents the theme of fear. Uh, so the women, the, the women have come, they're, they're going to, they think, um, uh, anoint Jesus with uh, burial spices um, uh, after his death. They see a young man, and this God's a young man dressed in a white robe at the tomb. The stone, big a stone is rolled away. They were alarmed, but he said to them, Don't be alarmed. We could translate, Don't be afraid. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised, he's not here. Look, here's the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. It's interesting, right? Peter had denied Jesus three times when Jesus was undergoing interrogation himself. Um, so the message, go and tell his disciples, and Peter, the one who denied his discipleship, um, that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So the women went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement and seized them. They said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And I think the earliest form of Mark's gospel ends there. So we've got this final note as one of, fear and, and uh, uh, paralyzing fear that keeps uh, the people, uh, in this case, the women followers of Jesus from speaking about resurrection. I wanna stop there for a moment. Uh, a number of passages where we see um, uh, an encounter with the holy and sort of a natural human response of uh, fear that uh, needs to be uh, addressed. Um, so what, what have you noticed so far, or uh, observations or questions that you have? I'll try to <clears throat> wet my whistle a little bit here. Anything you hear in those passages that may be a little different or uh, surprising today? Or are you like Mark's uh, women at the end with the <laughs> silence? No, I, re I really appreciate it, John, um, lining up these, you know, the transfiguration, the baptism, the arrest of Jesus, and the empty tomb, and Mark. Um, all, all these turn out to be, um, I guess, as you were saying um what you had mentioned theophany in your first um example uh, i guess maybe with an angel um so it's a it's a confrontation with an extraordinary uh you know the, the extraordinary and ordinary sacred and profane um and you use the word um you know, uh, naturally, their natural, their seeming natural response to the, you know, in extraordinary situations, we respond with kind of shock, awe, um, fear. You know, I, I, there's something there I like about that, um, that um, this kind of, I'm, I'm kind of, talking my way to a thought, but it's maybe something about God as extraordinary versus, um, you know, simply ordinary. I, uh, there's a little tension there for our yeah. tradition. But yeah, yeah, that, that, that's good, Dave. Yeah, there is a tension there. Um, uh, Carl Howie, who is the head of staff in the church in uh, Dearborn, where I first served and 
founded the uh, Howie Center for Art, Science, and Theology of the seminary. His sermon at my uh, uh, service of ordination was God in the ordinary. Right. And, and so that is an aspect of the biblical uh, story, right? Right. That we don't encounter God, you know, out in the stars somewhere, but in the normal flow uh, of life, right? And certainly Jesus is the one in whom God uh, comes to us in healing and uh, and call and vocation. So uh, here we have that embodied <clears throat> in, the, in the story of uh, Simon Peter, right? Where we're in a fishing boat, right? Now it's extraordinary, there's the extraordinary catch. And, and so Peter recognizes that Jesus isn't just another guy, right? He's something special, <laughs> there's something extraordinary about him. Um, but we meet God in the ordinary. And yet there are these moments and so the baptism and transfiguration, the arrest, you could identify a few other passages where uh, there is the sense that God isn't just um, a buddy that I'm going to have a beer with, right? That um, there is a holy presence that calls us beyond, right? Just who we are uh, in, an, in a normal sense. So there are these sort of high point moments in the, in the narrative. Yeah, and I think there's something about the, it's one of the things that makes that special is it is the claim of the extraordinary in the ordinary, that, right? That's, that what, that's what makes, that's part of what makes it, you know, have power in our lives that God comes and meets us in the ordinary, but it's still, it's the extraordinary in the ordinary. So, you know, you, you spoke there about a natural response. And I, I don't, you know, is that a human response? Is it, but it, um, what has happened that maybe in some sense we've lost that, right? That um, this, this kind of too comfortable assumption of God as ordinary. Um, so that's a question for me. The other is um, um, the language of fear not that you, you know, that is repeated. Um, I can hear someone saying, hey, no, right there, it's, the Bible tells us don't fear. So what's all this talk of a kind of healthy fear of God? Yeah, that's, that's great. That's great, Dave. Um, so, right, I mean, fear is, is a healthy and appropriate response to a whole lot of situations. And maybe uh, part of the problem with uh, pandemic response is that there isn't enough healthy fear, right? So that people don't feel like uh, they need to wear masks or social distance, you know. Uh, so fight, flight, uh, flight is, is a, an, a, I say natural response to um, some situations and fear is, is an appropriate response. So here I think the, the idea is, so uh, we, we ex experience a lot of things in life that um, are, are difficult and, uh, and involve uncertainty, whether it's physical health, uh, whether it's the fortunes of a, a loved one or a child, a grandchild and so on. Um, so um, I think the message is one about not being paralyzed by a fear that diminishes us, right, as humans. So, so to, to own fear that we do experience, um, but not get stuck there, right? And so in, in passages where we realize that we're not in control, that God who is sovereign, God who is holy presence, um, has a claim upon us, um, the message not to experience that encounter as one that diminishes you and brings you to nothing, annihilates you, but rather that the God who meets us, that Jesus who is there before you actually um, brings grace and brings compassion, brings uh, love and uh, and also a claim on you. So the vocation, the call to discipleship in Jesus's case. So you have that with, with Peter, right? Uh, Jesus doesn't cancel out Simon's awareness of his sin, of his, his lack. But the message is, ne nevertheless, I've got work for you, 
<laughs> I've got a, a call to you. And the same for, for us all. Um, so, you know, when we encounter change in something that's different, uh, fear is part of that. And so um, Peter experiences that, but Jesus walks him through that into a, a, a new way, a new path. I don't know if that, that helps at all, just kind of uh, thinking uh, through some of the things in your comment. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I, I take it in some sense the do not fear is in some sense rhetorical. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one other aspect to it, maybe uh, we'd get into the weeds with the Greek. Uh, <laughs> and I need to double check this, but my suspicion is that the tense, the verb tense that's used with the imperative is present tense. I'd have to double check that. And it may not be present tense in all the cases, but that would suggest don't continue in fear. Don't go on fearing. Um, so um, again, not being stuck there. Yeah. But fear is an experience on the way to a fuller, uh, deeper, richer experience that is empowering rather than uh, paralyzing. Yeah, that, that's, that's really great. I mean, that's very interesting kind of, uh, you know, that fear is part, is part of a process or something for, yeah. for God fearers. Yeah, I'm not a psychologist, but I mean, I mean some, some of you may be, um, but psychologists could really help us, you know, with, um, you know, how fear actually works uh, in, in us. Um, but here, I think the, the same way in, <clears throat> goodness, in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul is, is helping a Thessalonian Christian, uh, Christ-following group that is, is in distress because some of their loved ones have died. Uh, and they don't know what that means. Are these people left behind and left out of the future that God intends? And Paul says, uh, he, he's writing that they may, may not grieve as others do who don't have hope. And it's, I think, just really important to get that right, that it's not that grief is wrong and we avoid grief. It's that our grieving is expressed as people of faith who, who, who are called still to be hopeful. Um, so the, the reading of some New Testament texts like this as, as suppressing you know, full human emotion, including anger, including fear, including uh, grieving, including grief, that's, that's, an, that's not a helpful <laughs> way of reading those texts. So on the fear of God, again, these texts are not saying that fear has no place in, in uh, the human walk with God. Well, let's look at a, a few more texts and then maybe others want to get into the conversation, uh, Dave. So let me see if I can uh, pull that back up again. Um, here we have um, just a w very interesting uh, pickup of apocalyptic, uh, Jewish apocalyptic themes in uh, New Testament texts. I'm just going to highlight uh, 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 a little bit in Matthew and, uh, and Paul. So <clears throat> one of the things in, in, uh, in Judaism, in uh, late Second Temple Judaism, when the uh, covenant people experienced uh, history, experienced life as a very um, uh, uh, full, full of uh, defeat and, uh, and discouragement, um, uh, uh, dominated uh, people, temple in ruins, where is God? And the, the realization that sometimes it's precisely because people have sought to be faithful to God and, and to observe the Torah, keep the laws of uh, Moses, it's precisely because of that, that they have uh, experienced uh, hardship, adversity, even uh, persecution and death. So apocalyptic uh, literature arises in which the, pre the, the distress and the crisis and the suffering of the present um, gives way uh, to a future in which God sets things right. So beyond what we can see, the evidence of our eyes in, in the world, um, dare to believe that God will mend things, get, uh, set things right. So a lot of uh, text and very dramatic imagery have you know, a few texts in the Old Testament and many in uh, <clears throat> the couple centuries before uh, 
Jesus and alongside. So we see a lot of this <clears throat> in, uh, especially uh, heightened in Matthew's gospel. So I'm uh, calling <clears throat> some apocalyptic parables in Matthew, God images in those parables. So we've got <clears throat> uh, people who are presented as kings uh, and Jesus is telling parables in which uh, those kings do certain things. And uh, so the question is where, uh, these are parables of the kingdom of heaven as Matthew introduces them. So the question is, where is God in this story, in this parable that Jesus tells? Well, here's one in Matthew 18. <clears throat> uh, Jesus has just engaged in a brief conversation with Peter. Peter's asked, Peter's uh, heard, has picked up that Jesus is interested in our forgiving uh, one another. And Peter asks, how many times should I forgive the one who's wronged me? Seven times. And Jesus says, not seven times, but 77 times, or, or even 70 times seven, it could be translated. And so Jesus then goes on to tell this uh, parable, comparing the kingdom of heaven to a king who wants to settle accounts with his slaves. So he's got, we have a, a, a slave, a servant, clearly a very highly placed servant who owes 10,000 talents, which is you know, like billions of dollars in terms of contemporary measure. Um, he couldn't pay. So the king, his lord, ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave begs, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. Out of pity for him, the lord of that slave didn't give him more time but released him and forgave him the debt. So not patience, but, you know, um, debt canceling, um, compassion and mercy. So the same slave goes out, has a fellow slave who owes him a very a manageable debt. Um, he seizes him by the throat, says, pay what you owe. His fellow slave, again, pleads uh, for mercy, have patience with me, I will pay you. The same line that worked on the king, but it doesn't work on this, um, servant. He throws him into prison until he should pay the debt. Now the other slaves see what's happened and they report it to the king. The king calls his servant back and basically cancels the debt cancellation, uh, reinstates the debt, and um, hands him over to be tortured and puts him over into prison among the uh, uh, torturing uh, uh, custodians of the prison until he should pay his entire debt, which means uh, forever. So he says, my, uh, Jesus says, my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So this is an example of what, what we find in a number of Matthew's parables where, you know, very dramatic uh, escalation of images of uh, judgment. And what's particularly interesting in this one is that the warning about judgment comes to those who are being called to show mercy, right? So the, you, you got this uh, real strong tension built into the story as it sits within uh, Matthew 18. So we're called to show mercy to others after the pattern of the mercy that God shows. But here the warning is if we fail to, then our own uh, uh, plea for forgiveness or for mercy falls on deaf ears. So very, uh, very interesting and challenging text. Another one in Matthew 25, um, this is a um, parable of the talent. So talent um, figures again here. So five talent, two talent, one talent entrusted to slaves of a, of a prosperous man who's gone on a journey and they're supposed to invest, uh, invest in the stock market or whatever. Uh, turn a good return. So it's inter the most interesting, uh, the first two are very successful, five earns, five more, two earns, uh, more. Uh, but what's interesting is the third slave, and that's where the parable centers, really. Um, so the one who received just one talent uh, uh, comes forward uh, when the master returns to, to get his um, get the return on his investment. Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you didn't scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. So he's gone and reclaimed it and uh, returns the original talent. So the master's response is not kind. Uh, and so we end up with a similar refrain 
at the end of this. Uh, take the talent from the one, give it uh, to the guy with 10 talents. Um, as for this worthless slave, very strong and unkind language, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the mixing of imagery about, you know, just a, you know, a prosperous man in, in the story um, and a God image as one who, um, a, war a warning about um, um, potential judgment. So briefly, uh, a text in, in Romans. So uh, again, so, so we've got this tension between mercy and judgment. Uh, in Matthew, and I gave just a couple of ex examples, in, in uh, Paul also, uh, Romans 1 begins with a picture of the God wrongness of all human life. Paul says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. And he goes on, basically the idea is that the creator should be known uh, by the creature and honored and worshiped. Um, there's enough about uh, God, the creator, uh, seen in the world that um, human creatures should uh, know, acknowledge, and worship God. But we turn to idolatry instead. We worship the cre uh, creature rather than the creator. And the language there in 125 to, to worship could also be translated fear. So again, the same sense, uh, reverence for God. Uh, but the, the human uh, creature... Uh, serve not the creator, um, but um, that which is not God. Now, um, this is the first part of the argument in Romans, um, where Paul shows that all, all human beings is in, in the grip of sin and cannot, um, uh, we, can, we can't save ourselves, we can't uh, make ourselves right with God because of the hold of sin upon all of um, the human creature. Um, but he's on his way to uh, a different kind of claim. In 321, he talks about the revealing not of God's wrath, but of God's righteousness. And that then becomes the main uh, argument in the, this next part of the letter, chapters three through five, where God uh, sets the human creature, even the broken, uh, sinful human creature, uh, right with God, because God is a gracious and loving God, not because we... Uh, deserve it. So this, uh, again, in, in Matthew, mercy and judgment intention, in Paul, uh, judgment, the holy God who calls the people to f fidelity and to uh, genuine worship of God, but then God uh, meets the, the sinful human and sets us right, restores us, mends the human uh, create, uh, creation. A um, couple more things, and then uh, <clears throat> paying attention to the clock, we have about seven minutes left, so I want to have some time for some um, questions and comments. Uh, so um, you have this passage in First John, first letter of John, chapter four. Very interesting kind of counter uh, to the theme of fear of God that we've been exploring. So this is in company with the, the don't be afraid in the presence of the holy God. God because God is love, there is no fear in love. Uh, the uh, author of First John says, perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. You know, think of the passages and the, the, par the parables that we were seeing in, in, in Matthew, right? Uh, fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears hasn't reached perfection in love. So should we um, be terrified of the prospect of punishment because God is holy? And we're not. <laughs> uh, no, God loves us. And in fact, because God loves us and we've experienced that love, we are empowered to love others. We love because God first loved us. So knowing God is, is a God who says yes to us, a God who steadfastly loves us, um, we are, are not imprisoned in fear. And not only are we not paralyzed by fear, we are empowered to extend that love also uh, to others. Matthew's interested in our extending mercy to others. Here the emphasis is extending uh, love. Uh, finally, we could have a lot of fun with the book of Revelation. That's a whole other set of courses, uh, a set of uh, class sessions. But we uh, tend often to think about uh, Re Revelation in terms of these terrifying images, right, of the destruction that happens. So we've got all these images of judgment and the visions in Revelation. 
And, and, and what John is doing is picturing what he believes is coming, the fall uh, of the Roman Empire, the imperial system of domination, oppression, and all the idolatrous uh, claims of the imperial system, that all of that is going to come crashing down, John thinks. Um, but all of those um, very difficult and challenging and violent images in the first um, many chapters of Revelation are on the way to this uh, picture of the descent of the, of the heavenly uh, city of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth. So God's holy presence without a temple even needed any longer. Um, in fact, we don't even need a sun and moon any longer because of the divine radiance that all will experience. Um, so uh, images of the mending and restoration of all of humankind and of all of creation, that's, that's where the book of Revelation is, is going. So um, again, moving through fear um, because of the, the power of empire, moving through fear to uh, confident um, hope based on, on the, the faithfulness and the power of God. So just a few more uh, aspects of the New Testament uh, to challenge us a little bit. So um, we have a few minutes left. So any, any comments, thoughts, questions? Four minutes to de deal with those difficult <laughs> parables. <laughs> Dave, got, uh, you and Ellen have some work to do there. <laughs> T typical professor making things more complicated. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really do think, I mean, I spent a lot of time thinking about these tensions in Matthew's gospel, um, that God is compassionate and merciful and wants us to be the same. Uh, we, we model our uh, care for others and the mercy we show to others on God's mercy, right? Um, and the way Matthew, uh, using sort of this apocalyptic uh, images, the way Matthew uh, gets our attention, shakes us up, makes us realize how, how important it is to live this way. The stakes are, are really high to embody, right, this um, mercy. The way it's motivated is problematic with these pictures of punishment, you know, to scare, <laughs> to scare us into being merciful. <laughs> it's a little different from the way Luke, I think, the way Luke uh, presents it in the, in the parables in Luke. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I, don't, I don't know if folks have thoughts the, and the, the strong contrast there or the seemingly strong contrast with First John uh, as, you know, the, the, the name of these two, what we titled these two sessions, Perfect Love, Cast Out Fear. Um, and um, by your language there um, uh, with Matthew kind of, what is Matthew after a kind of a wake up call or something to hypocrisy? Yeah, um, yeah that's a good way of putting it then. Uh, what is John, what is first John about? Um, I, uh, I take it there, a community riven by fear or uh, yeah. fear of punishment. Yeah, it's interesting. First John, um, if we had more time with that, this is a conflicted community. Some they've really come apart, they've unraveled. Uh, some um, members of the community have left. They, and it's, it's around differences in, in Christology, different understandings of Jesus. Is Jesus really fully and authentically human, in, including his suffering? And there are different ways of understanding that. And so the co co committee, the committee, probably the committees come apart too, but the communities experience this schism, this conflict. So you know, when you've gone through a wrenching, tra traumatizing experience like that, you're you're among those left in the community. I mean, fear, <laughs> fear about what's coming, uncertainty about what's coming, would would make a lot of sense. So the call to love one another is in the context of experience of, of a lot of hostility, right? Um, but the author, so perfect love casts out fear. You know, in terms of our earlier conversation, it's really not casting out fear, but we work through the fear in order to remain lovingly connected to others. Even though, yeah, you know, when we're with, when we are, are, are aware that we're with others who are different from us, right? That that can be kind of something we feel some anxiousness about, some fear about, um, but to work, work through that, work through the fear to, um, to love, even love the different uh, other. 
Uh, Luke puts that in dramatic terms with the Samaritan parable, where you see even the, the distrusted, and hated enemy is one in whom we can see uh, love and compassionate care uh, modeled. So that's what we're called to also across the, all the boundaries that we construct as, as humans. That's great. Um, John, I, I really appreciate the, um, I mean, one of the things that em emerges for me today is this kind of theme of working through fear, that this is um, in many cases a natural and healthy response to extraordinary circumstances in our life, including with uh, God and the move there is, is uh, maybe not to suppress that, but also not to get fixated on that. Right, and, and I think also when, when we think about God as God, and that's a bottom line what this is about, right? God is, is God. And life isn't something that we control in all respects, right? In fact, with pandemic, we've learned there are a lot of things we, we really don't, don't control. Um, but to, uh, under, to come to the awareness that in spite of our own limitations, of, of which we're very aware that God comes to us, um, mends, restores us, and, and has something for us to do, something purposeful and meaningful in the world for us to do. Um, God is faithful in, in that way. And so our fear is, is not to keep us from answering the call. That's the strong biblical uh, pattern when God's call comes to people to serve in the world. Our first response is no way, right. not, equipped, not equipped, not able to do that, but to work through our awareness of limitation, our fear on the way to um, responding as best we're able. No, I, I, that just seems uh, like a great place to leave it as we, you know, um, hopefully this spring and summer uh, re-engage uh, uh, the world around us, um, you know, in a transitional period. There's certainly, we're bound to be fearful and uh, that makes sense in, in lots of ways. And um Oh, don't, well. mean, don't mean to interrupt, Dave, but yeah, I just saw a Facebook post a couple of days ago from someone who talked about having become agoraphobic because of a year of pandemic, you know, being uh, sheltered at, at home and really afraid of going out, mm -hmm. you know, to re-engage the world again. And our kids going into school, folks going into churches again, are re-engaging in communities. A fear is, is going to be part of that. So how to be smart how to be smart and, and cautious as appropriate, um, but also open to re-engaging life. That's great. Um, well, John, would you um, mind uh, giving a voice to our uh, prayers sure. this morning? Sure, and I'll, I'll be brief because I, I, I know we're out of time. So shall we pray? Holy God, awesome and majestic, holy presence, thank you for meeting us where we are, as we are, in all our need, all our desire to serve you, in all our experiences of um, life, good and, and bad. Help us to hear a call to serve you in ways that are, are possible for us and open to us, honoring you as God and knowing that you call us as we are into your service. Bless all those whom we love in this community, these communities, and um, sustain us, sustain us in all the ways that we need to serve you as uh, your, your children, your people in Christ's name.